Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. Today I'll be sharing the process of making an elliptical hoop skirt with some amount of success. This is the second hoop skirt I'm making in a three-part series that is sponsored by Skillshare. And unfortunately, this one didn't go quite as well as the first. I'd originally hoped this could be a tutorial, and though it's hopefully informative and educational, I don't think the end result is quite good enough to call this a how-to video. That's why the title is Attempting to Make an Elliptical Hoop Skirt. Now, first of all, you might be wondering, what is an elliptical hoop skirt? These were crinolines worn in the mid-1800s, and like the name suggests, it's a hoop skirt that isn't perfectly round shaped. Instead, it's more of an oval, or specifically an oval with a flattened end, since the front of these skirts were quite straight and had a pretty narrow front profile, with a lot of volume at the back. But the volume was a gentle slope from the waist to the hem, not like the big bushy bustles that became popular years following. However, when I'm talking about volume, I do mean a lot of volume, at least in the mid-1860s, which is the period I'm basing this piece off of. And I used a pattern, kind of, specifically the one on page 94 of Nora Waugh's Corsets and Crinolines. This book has images of dozens of patterns, but they're scaled way down with a key that allows you to size them up. I used that key to find the actual measurement of each piece, then transferred those measurements onto paper to create a workable pattern. And the paper I'm using is quite literally construction paper. You can get it at Home Depot in the painting section. And I did make a few alterations to the pattern, like adding four inches to the length of the skirt, and two inches to the center of each panel, making my hoop skirt 16 inches bigger than the original pattern. Both of these were to account for my love of giant poofy skirts and also my height. I'm 5 foot 10, so a good bit taller than your average 19th century lady. And in hindsight, I would have added another 4 inches to the length of this because it definitely ran short. I'm also adding seam allowance since that is not included in any of Wa's patterns. With the pattern done, I could start cutting the hoop skirt out, and I'm using a lightly printed white quilting cotton for this project. I'm also paying a lot of attention to the grain line here, since you don't want any bias or diagonally cut edges being sewn together, because they'll be more prone to warping and distorting the shape of the skirt. When cutting this out, the only piece I didn't follow a pattern for were the side back panels, since these are just rectangles. Now I'm pinning the side back panels to the back panels and the side front panels to the front panels with the wrong sides facing each other. Something important to mention here is that the pieces should be matched up at the hem first and pinned from the hem to the waist of the skirt, with excess material eased into the top edge. You want, above everything, for the hem to be level, since that is going to be what determines the boning placement. If the upper edges aren't level, it can just be trimmed. The pieces were sewn together with half inch seams, then I trimmed the seam allowance down to a quarter of an inch. The seams were ironed open, then folded on the seam line and pinned again with the right sides facing each other, with all the raw edges tucked away. This was repeated for all of the pieces. And then they were sewn again, neatly creating finished French seams, which I think are called English seams everywhere else. That's America for you, changing the names of things. And on top of sewing the French seams, I'm also top stitching the seam allowance down, as close to the outer edge as I can. This is to prevent the seam allowance from flipping up and potentially interfering with the boning channels later on. And again, this was repeated for all of the seams. With the first batch of French seams done, now I'm turning the top 12 inches of the front edge of the front panels inward by a half inch, then inward once again, creating a half inch rolled hem. I did this on both front panels, then top stitched the hem in place. And this part will be left open even when sewing the remaining seams to allow the garment to be put on and off. Now I'm continuing to assemble the skirt and pinning the next batch of pieces together, then sewing them, trimming them, ironing them, pinning them, re-sewing them, top stitching them, and ironing them once again. You know, the whole French seam process. 
there really aren't that many steps involved in this whole project. It's just a few steps repeated. A lot. Okay, a few might be an understatement, but prepare for a lot of repetition. And in this case, since I have a good bit of time to fill, it seems like a good time to talk about today's sponsor, which is Skillshare. I've worked with them several times before, so you may have heard of them, but Skillshare is an online learning community for creators. Their annual premium membership subscription starts at less than $10 a month and gives you unlimited access to over 25,000 classes. Their classes range from business to photography with absolutely everything in between. So whether it's your writing, graphic design, or drawing abilities that you're looking to improve, they will most likely have something for you. As I've said before, I'm trying to finally figure out how to properly use some of the programs that I pay for every month, and their classes have been really useful for learning about and learning to use features that I didn't even know existed. So if there's something you would like to improve at, or something new you're interested in learning, I would encourage you to check them out. There will be a link in the description to their website, and the first 500 people who use it can try premium membership for two months for free and can join the 7 million people who are already using and enjoying Skillshare. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and Hoopskirt Madness in general, and let's get back to some of that madness. Though it hasn't gotten so mad just yet. When all the pieces were sewn together, I ironed the skirt, then began marking the hem. I wanted a half inch rolled hem, so I'm marking a line one inch away from the bottom edge of the skirt on the wrong side of the fabric. And this is done all the way around the skirt, which has a good 120 inch circumference. And usually I would just do this by eye, but I really wanted to keep the hem level, and even a quarter inch could make the finished thing lopsided. I'm folding the bottom edge of the skirt upward so it touches the line I marked, then stitching it down. Now the hem should naturally want to turn inward where the material is doubled, which is half an inch away from the hem. So folding it inward creates the half inch rolled hem I wanted, and this was stitched down as well. And now the process of marking boning channels begins. The first boning channel is one half an inch away from the hem, so I can actually use the hem allowance as a guide for the placement. The next boning channel will be an inch and a half above that. And to mark its placement, I'm using a one and a half inch wide template I made and a water soluble marking pen. The next boning channel can be found by moving the template up so it sits against the line I just marked, then marking the top edge of the template again. And right now I'm just marking the bottom four boning channels, which will extend all the way around the skirt. Later on there will be boning channels that skip over the side panels or skip over the front panels. But since the marking placement is based on the hem shape, I'm going to be marking the lowest bones first and working my way up. Which is how I like to do it anyway, since you get the longest and most time consuming boning channels out of the way first, and the project gets progressively faster as you go. For my boning channels, I will be using twill tape, and twill tape is a flexible woven tape that won't warp the way something like bias tape will. The flexibility also gives it the ability to smoothly form to curves, something that satin or grow grain ribbon won't do. It's great stuff, but I ordered the wrong size, so I'll be folding it in half as they stitch it on. So the first twill tape boning channel is just above the hem, and you always want to sew the bottom edge on first, so I'm positioning it against the hem, then sewing as close to the edge of the twill tape as I can. I'm doing this kind of slowly because I want it to really match the curve of the hem. And this was the case for all the boning channels, actually. I went slow because I wanted them to be perfectly positioned. After the bottom edge is sewn, the top edge gets top stitched down too. And make sure you overlap the ends of the twill tape by a few inches so it looks nicer. Now I'm moving on to the next boning channel, lining it up with the line I marked, then top stitching it in place, starting with the bottom edge. I repeated this one more time, then switched back to marking, because you don't want to use a boning channel you've sewn as a guide for marking other channels. You want to follow your previous markings. They are going to be more accurate. So I always mark one more channel than I plan on sewing in that session, so I can use it as a guide for marking the next batch. And speaking of batch, this time I marked 8 channels with a 2 inch wide template, except these channels have a break in them, and don't continue onto the rectangular side back panels. So I'm only marking the back front and side front panels. 
The boning will continue under these panels, it just won't be contained to the channels. In Wad's book, it says the bones are hinged under these pieces, probably to make it easier to sit in, but hoop skirt hinges don't really exist anymore, so mine won't have those. However, I can follow the construction method for the fabric portions. So now I'm just repeating the process of sewing bony channels. Hopefully I can find some killer background music for this to make this video less boring. Actually, I have a tip. Make a ton of bobbins before you start on a project like this. I think I went through 10 during this project and it's so annoying to pause progress just because you need more bobbins. And if you don't have enough bobbins to do that, look on Amazon or eBay. A lot of sewing supply retailers will sell them in bulk for cheap. And those same retailers will probably sell sewing machine needles that will fit your machine for much cheaper than you will get at Joann's. The same is the case for snaps and hooks and bars and most sewing notions. <laughs> And now it is back to the awkward silence. It's like talking to me in real life. Or not talking to me, I guess. Now it's time to mark the remaining four boning channels, and these are marked on the side front, back, and side back panels with the front being left free. I think the bones are supposed to stop before the front section, but they could also extend beyond the channels like they did at the sides. It's not clear with the limited information that WA provides. So I opted to make them a little bit larger and to make them continuous. Also, you couldn't see much of what I was doing here in this lighting, so here's a close up. And wow, look, we're back to sewing more boning channels. There sure are a lot of these, like 15 or something. That's like 40 yards of boning channels to sew. It took literal hours, but luckily through the magic of editing, it can be condensed to mere minutes. Once all the channels have been sewn, it's time to move on to the waistline and waistband. You want this finished before adding the boning because the skirt is far more manageable before that is added. I'm gathering the top edge of the skirt down one panel at a time using running stitches, and I'm following the measurements marked on the pattern. So the front panel was left ungathered, the side front was gathered to two inches, the side back was gathered to four inches, and the back gathered to three inches, which means the skirt was made for a larger than average waist at the time. I actually had to gather it more later on to get it to fit snugly over my corset. And I didn't follow their waistband pattern. Since it's just a rectangle, I decided to make my own. This was pinned to the skirt with the right sides facing each other and half an inch of the waistband extending past the ends of the skirt. Then it was sewn on with a half inch allowance, and I might have knocked my camera when sitting down, so this is almost out of frame. Oops. <laughs> now I'm folding the waistband in half and pinning the ends together. These were sewn with a half inch allowance. Then the corners were clipped. And now I'm folding the raw edge of the waistband inward by a half inch and pinning it down. And I sewed that edge down by hand using whip stitches. And now with our husk of a hoop skirt complete, it's time for boning slash hooping wire. And I'm using much thinner boning this time around. It's really almost like wire in terms of its dimensions at least. It's made from spring steel, so it snaps back into shape and is a much better choice than actually using wire even though it's got wire in the name and it's kind of confusing. And helpfully, Nora Wah's pattern actually includes the length of each bone. So I'm using those measurements for mine, but adding the 16 inches of extra volume and five inches so the bones can overlap and there won't be a point of great stress, which means that all of my bones ended up being 21 inches longer than the dimensions listed in her book. And I'm using a measuring tape taped to my cutting table to mark the boning and bolt cutters to cut the boning. 
And now the hooping wire can be inserted into the boning channels. And this first one I must have cut to the wrong length because it was really tiny. So let's ignore that for the time being and move on to another one. I don't have a lot to say about this process, it's pretty straightforward. I'm just feeding the appropriate length of wire through the channel. It's a mixture of pushing it and kind of gathering the fabric over top of it and then also pushing the end of the boning and just kind of going back and forth and making sure the wire doesn't get snagged on the twill tape or the fabric because it can break through and you really don't want that to happen. For the lower continuous channels, the wire actually overlaps itself within the twill tape channel, but for these, the sides are open, so the wire actually meets up and overlaps on one of the sides outside of the boning channel. I'm overlapping the ends by 5 inches, then taping them together with medical tape. The tape is temporary since my metal connectors didn't arrive on time, but this was kind of a happy accident since it was easy to remove, I could play with the lengths of the bones later on, and easily alter the shape of the skirt, which was unfortunately very necessary. Now I'm cutting more length of boning. I did a lot of these off camera because I'm not sure how helpful this footage is. But here's me struggling with bolt cutters for 10 seconds. I thought that was important to leave in. And now these bones are being fed through the channels as well. At this point, all but one of the bones had been added, and it was the wrong shape. It was fat, okay? I had no obese looking hoop skirt. So I cut open the tape and took five inches out of the top few bones, or wires. It's technically called hooping wire, but it behaves differently from wire, so I usually call it boning. Sorry. And it's really amazing how big of a difference removing five inches made to the shape overall. And once the shape was improved, I added the final bone, but the shape still wasn't perfect. The petticoat tilted forward and was much more round than it should be, so I'm using a couple tricks to slightly change the shape. Trick one is a two pound weight. This weight will be sewn into the front of the hoop and the weight will force the front down, creating the flattened front effect that was popular. This also forces the back of the hoop skirt to stick out, improving the elliptical shape. Some people do this with washer safety pin down the front, but I prefer a single heavier weight. And this is being sewn to the twill tape on the interior of the hoop. And this is an inside of the hoop shot. It's big enough to fit me and a tripod under there, which is kind of hilarious. And now I have another trick up my sleeves. Tapes, or ribbon, I guess. This ribbon is tied to the bones at the sides of the hoop skirt and pulled tightly until the hoop skirt has a narrower silhouette. Then the ribbon is tied off at a bone on the opposite side. I tied three of these onto the back of the skirt, and I also wore the skirt over a bum pad, which causes it to jut out in the back, further exaggerating the shape. And this is the kind of finished elliptical hoop skirt. I say kind of because I'm still not totally happy with the shape, so I might fiddle with it at some point. And it needs a hook and eye closure. I'm waiting until I make a new corset to finalize the placement of that, along with waiting for my metal connectors to arrive so I can finalize the shape in general. Overall, I just feel okay about this project. The shape isn't quite what I hoped it would be. I think it's appropriate for mid-1860s pieces and evening garments for most of the 1860s, but it's got a fuller, more cupcake-ish shape than I was expecting. I think this is partially based on the additions I made, but it's also a much larger hoop skirt than the angle shown in Waz books makes it appear. I really don't think my additions change the shape that drastically, especially by removing some of the volume and cutting the bones down later on. And on top of that, it's a bit lumpy, but petticoats really will fix that, so I'm trying not to beat myself up over it too much. So those are my thoughts and I'm curious to see if they'll change in time and when I have petticoats and a dress to go over top of this. Also this hoop skirt collapses flat like all of my others and since it's made from spring steel you can easily walk through doors or fit it in a car. It'll spring back into shape when you're done. It's also surprisingly light. You can jump in it, you can dance in it, you really have quite a lot of freedom of movement since unlike a petticoat it is held away from your body and doesn't interfere with your stride at all. If you enjoyed this video, giving it a like and a comment really helps me out. And if you'd like to see me attempt a bustle hoop skirt, then subscribe and stay tuned because that is coming next month. 
I'll also hopefully be making something to go over this in the coming months, both much needed petticoats and a pretty dress. Thanks again for watching and I shall talk to all of you very soon.